Oh, hello, I'm Dr. Asher Khan. Uh, I'm a specialist psychiatrist uh, who is practicing in the neuropsychiatry of ADHD and uh, high-functioning ASD. Um, I'm discussing uh, ADHD and sports uh, exercise and the athlete today, and you're listening to the Physical Performance Show. I've had my ups and my downs. I think it's an absolutely breakthrough experience. Welcome to the Physical Performance Show, the show designed to inspire the pursuit of your physical best performance. I'm your host, Brad Beer. Listen in as we delve into how the world's top physical performers achieve their success, as well as the highs, the lows, and the journey of getting there. Let's get ready, set, let's go. Welcome to the Physical Performance Show, brought to you by Precision Hydration's all-new Precision Fuel Range, the Physical Performance Show's upcoming live stream featuring UK-based sports dietitian and author Rinny McGregor, and of course, Pogo Physio's online telehealth consultations. I'm Brad Beer, sports physiotherapist and exercise scientist by trade and training and founder of Pogo Physio. Each week, we'll bring you the latest and greatest information and inspiration designed to help you perform at your physical best. And of course, we do this across a range of our episodes, including interest editions, catch episodes, coaches' corners, featured performers, and of course, the very popular expert editions. Now, coming off the back of last week's featured performer episode featuring Australian triathlon legend, winner of the ITU World Cup Series Championship for 2002 and 2003 and winner of over 100 international triathlons, Australian Olympian Greg Bennett, we're jumping this week into an all-important exploration around all things ADHD, sport and exercise. Now, this is a crucial conversation that will impact so many of us, be it coaches, athletes, or the practitioners that tune into this show. You see, some of history's most successful and outstanding iconic sports people are known ADHD sufferers. These include the great Michael Phelps and Michael Jordan. And as you'll learn today, the ADHD brain has an innate ability to hyperfocus. Now, this can serve athletes extremely well. However, with every blessing comes a burden, and that is certainly true for the ADHD brain. During today's conversation, you'll discover the prevalence of ADHD in society, the prevalence, quite interestingly, amongst athletes, and it's high, how to diagnose ADHD, what are the three key attributes or characteristics of the ADHD brain, Dr. Asher Khan will share around the biology of the ADHD brain and explain why it is that the ADHD brain will always crave dopamine. Dr. Khan shares around why ADHD brains and sufferers, despite popular opinions by many in their world, are not addicted necessarily to exercise, but rather will display or exhibit addictive behaviors and why it's important to make that distinction. Dr. Khan will explain the pros in addition to being able to hyperfocus that do come alongside the ADHD brain, but also the cons, if you like. Dr. Khan will outline why it is that ADHD sufferers so often experience depression and anxiety. Now, I have to admit that when I had the pleasure of sitting with Dr. Asher Khan to record this expert edition, my mouth was quite literally on the table as it felt like Dr. Khan was reading my mail. Now, as a sports physiotherapist, I often say that we don't treat people's physical pain. We treat athletes' psychology in the sense that you get an athlete that's injured on the sideline and it's the anxieties, frustrations, fears that that athlete is most burdened by through that injury process. And over the years, I've reflected as I've discovered more about my own biological makeup, including my ADHD brain, that so many of the patients that I see week in, week out in the consult room at Pogo Physio likely sit somewhere amongst the conversation that we're having today. 
Now, by way of bio, Dr. Asha Khan is a specialist psychiatrist, director and founder of Queensland ADHD and Neurosciences Clinic. Dr. Khan first recognised the vast prevalence of undetected ADHD during his addiction training. In the ensuing years, Dr. Khan observed similar patterns of lack of recognition, early detection and diagnosis, a one-stop specialist platform for early diagnostic detection and treatment intervention, specifically for ADHD, autism or other specific learning disorders. Queensland ADHD and Neurosciences Clinic was set up as a novel, unique clinic allowing top experts in neurodevelopmental disorders using a cutting-edge scientific approach in keeping with modern research and international guidelines. Dr. Asha Khan is a subspecialist in neurocognitive disorders for children, adolescents and adults offering expertise in attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, ADHD, autism spectrum disorders, including Asperger's, specific learning deficits, and the dual diagnosis of neurocognitive developmental disorders coexisting with addiction behavior. This is an expert edition that, pardon the pun, will boggle your mind. So get your pen and paper ready for this exploration with Dr. Asha Khan, specialist psychiatrist and founder of Queensland ADHD and Neurosciences Clinic on all things ADHD, sport and exercise. Dr. Asha Khan, specialist psychiatrist and director of Queensland ADHD and Neurosciences Clinic. Welcome to the Physical Performance Show. Hello, Brad. Thank you for inviting me. Our deep dive today is on this theme that we're titling ADHD, Exercise and Sport. We've got a bit to cover. Uh, Maybe we start with a little bit of your academic background and what led you, Dr. Asha Khan, to explore the field of psychiatry and in particular your clinical specialization which is ADHD, ASD, learning disabilities and so much more. Thanks Brad. So I have the general psychiatry training uh, from um, UK and then I have my specialist uh, qualifications and fellowships from Australia and in the course of doing my general psychiatry with adults and with children I had a stint of three years where I was fortunate enough to get trained in addiction psychiatry because addiction is so Uh, prevalent in individuals with mental health issues. And when I was doing my uh, addiction psychiatry uh, training stint, I realized the role of uh, brain neurons and wiring and the whole mind-brain-body neurofeedback loop in a manner that uh, made me think about the missed uh, diagnoses of these very, very subtle and fine neurocognitive or neurodevelopmental disorders, uh, which we now see most commonly as ADHD uh, and perhaps uh, the issues related to our functioning, our everyday life, our executive uh, capacity in people with uh, autistic spectrum disorders. So this is where I started thinking about uh, the uniqueness and the novelty of wiring of these individuals. And when I uh, looked at addiction, I found that while we were treating addiction from a top down, when you actually looked at some of the shared stories of uh, individuals, they were quite smart uh, to start with. And sometimes I found that they were smart, but their results were not reflective of how smart they were. And so I got very interested in looking at the manner in which they evolved and what got them to this stage of addiction. Uh, So, uh, and and that kind of started my interest in looking at executive functioning disorders, uh, neurocognitive disorders, how we are shaped by our environment, how we are shaped by diet, sleep, exercise, and not just the uh, influence of early attachment figures and parenting and relationships and so on and so forth. So it all kind of started to come together. What we now call epigenetics is environment, genetics, um, and the role of uh, our experiences uh, and social experiences as we grow up. Uh, So I was fascinated amongst those experiences with the neural makeup of individuals and architecture because three people with similar level of adversity would turn out to be different. Mm. So there is something in the genetics which is 
shaping their growth and executive functioning in the long run in a different way. One would become a stock market expert, one would become a real estate person, and a third would become an ad addict and would continuously seek opioids or cannabis and would, would have joblessness, relationship issues where the other two people in the same class would be up there. So this variation is where I started looking and I realized that these, there's a high prevalence of these uh, aberrations in, in the way we are wired. Uh, and this was my interest in looking in, into the neurocognitive disorders and I found ADHD uh, being there. And ADHD, Asher, is so widely known slash referred to, but I feel that it's probably poorly understood in terms of what it actually is. Mm -hmm. It feels like at times, from a non-psychiatric point of view, uh, as an allied health professional, that it just feels like a little bit of a, an over-diagnosis at times from mm -hmm. maybe people that aren't, mm -hmm. aren't trained to make a diagnosis. So the obvious question is, what is ADHD, mm -hmm. Asher, and how does it get diagnosed? Okay, so... Um uh, so ADHD, in its very simple um, definition, is a uh, disorder primarily genetic, but uh, having, uh, as I said earlier, epigenetic influences, so the role of environment, etc. cetera. Um, but it, it actually is to, it, it has to do with a neurochemical um, unique functioning where there are deficits of certain neurochemicals, i.e. for the purpose of this interview, in particular norepinephrine and dopamine. It is most commonly diagnosed in early childhood or adolescence. Uh, it most commonly um, uh, is quite uh, persistent uh, as we grow up in adults. Uh, and it is a primarily has three core features which will be uh, which will need to be established that they were there when we were when when somebody was born, which are the uh, impulsivity, uh, the inattentiveness, uh, and uh, what we call uh, uh, problems with inhibition, such as not knowing what to do, you know, when to stop, uh, when to redirect ourselves to something, how to. St uh, you know, not lose the priority of life and organization of life, etc. There are many other features, but these three core features are usually a part and parcel of ADD uh, individuals' lives. So that was impulsivity, inattentiveness, and inhibition. Inhibition problems or uh, inhibition uh, problem with deficits. Inhibition. Yes, problems with inhibition yeah. deficits. And I presume this is on a spectrum. Would that be correct? I mean, you can, you can call it on a spectrum of severity and a spectrum of the manner in which it affects people, which is then contingent on many other things, you know, people's lifestyles, people's genetic IQ, their social supports. We, we, so, I, yes, it kind of presents itself in a various strata of people in different ways from uh, a mild impact uh, of those symptoms uh, on, on one area, of, let's say inattention, as opposed to in another person who has more problems with uh, uh, impulse discontrol, um, uh, you know, where the anger is the issue. Um, mm -hmm. And then it could be on the other spectrum, on the other end, it completely is uh, missed, uh, for instance, in people who are high functioning, but uh, so nobody's picking it up in a standard way in school years and later years, but it actually catches up with you on the other end of the spectrum in life crises, relationships, uh, physical health. Uh, in fact, there are some studies uh, by Russell Barkley uh, about how uh, ADD is affecting my human mortality, you know, by, uh, uh, in terms of morbidity, the illness, the suffering, the burden of physical issues. So yes, it can vary, and there are many, many factors involved in how it can present itself. Uh, generally, we don't use the word ADD spectrum because people will mix it up with the Spurge spectrum and autism spectrum. That, that's uh, interesting, it, but it does require the three core features to be present for a diagnosis to be made. At one stage or another, oh, it yeah. is a specialist job. Yeah. Uh, a, the medical interview is a very thorough interview, because uh, which has to establish that the core ADHD features in one way or another Ha were present and we need to establish it because people like you and I and busy people if you take a snapshot of us we will be very ADHD 
throughout our lives, you know, when we're doing our exams or when we are pre prepping up. I remember you were prepping up for your, um, uh, you know, your uh, recent race, you know. Oh, man. And, and I was in physio with you and you were like total ADHD in that moment. So, <laughs> so we are all in moments of ADHD. You know, prior to doing this interview, I was quite ADD according to my daughter this morning. So, uh, because I was prepping up, you know, Brad's coming over, etc. So, so we need to the, the art of ADHD diagnosis is to rule out what's not actually ADHD and is probably just ADHD behavior mm. uh, as seen by others. Uh, but the actual executive functioning deficits, they will be the core symptoms as per DSM-5 or the general worldwide guidelines have to be established. So you need to rule out things like sleep, diet, you know, all the things that can cause a kind of a false positive ADHD diagnosis, drug taking, etc. The ADHD and ADD, mm -hmm. what's the difference? You hear them sort of both thrown around and what yeah. is the actual difference? Yeah, look, uh, th th this has caused a lot of confusion. So uh, really, there's no difference. Um, these terms are used quite interchangeably nowadays. But if you want to know the very basic difference is uh, as the name suggests, with ADHD, the H or the behavioral symptoms are a little bit more pronounced, uh, mostly seen in children, mostly males. Okay, And these become more impulsive behavioral problems as we grow up. On the other hand, when you have the second type, which is the ADD, it's called the inattentive type. And as the name suggests, the issues are more uh, internally um, making one person not follow through with things, getting distracted, zoning out, spacing out, um, and they really don't have as much preponderance of behavioral uh, surge of uh, problems. So for instance, they don't grow up to be as aggressive or as impulsive or you know get all those troubles, but they internally it's, the, it's almost an equal burden of, of struggle with everything that they do because it's more inattentiveness. Uh, related uh, uh, struggles. Yeah, okay, that's focus, concentration, working hard, putting in hours to get productivity, you know, for 10 minutes and, and you know, just fatigue, exhaustion, you know, burnouts. So that's the inattentive variety, whereas the usually the ones who get into trouble and get picked up early is the itch variety. And that's why boys in younger years are diagnosed two or three times more often than girls who kind of wing it. Even though they may have the inattentive type, the ADD, because it's an internal versus an external manifestation. Kind of, yeah. Or I mean, I, I, yeah. I mean you, you, the inattentive will have uh, uh, probably, uh, you know, slightly higher chance of escaping uh, the net if, if the, especially if a child is using smartness and intelligence to compensate for the inattentiveness, and that's what happens. That's why we are missing so many people, because our school systems are so uh, easily, you know, can be catered to if you're just born smart. Mm -hmm. And it only catches up with you when things get boring, which is usually high school or a time of transition when you have to, when you're not going to wing it. There's going to be no smartness or, or intelligence getting you to escape this one. And when they get, the more boring it gets, the more they start to be challenged and the inattentiveness comes to surface. Fascinating. Mm -hmm. uh, wow, that's, uh, that's so interesting. And, and just on setting the scene, if you like, before we discuss the management and the, the role of exercise and, mm -hmm. and how this manifests in athletes, mm -hmm. uh, prevalence of this in society and you know, the, the average age of diagnosis, mm -hmm. uh, diagnosis, sorry, uh, any sort of setting the scene, things you could share there, Asha, around, yeah. around this? So, certainly. So, um, the worldwide average for the prevalence of ADHD in children under 14 lies somewhere in the 4 to 5 percent um, uh, margin. However, there are studies which talk about how it's underdiagnosed, and it could be 4 to 8 percent, and, um, and so on. Uh, in Australia, uh, Deloitte uh, recently did an audit report uh, for trying to measure in fiscal costs the, the cost to the government 
um, uh, for the burden of undiagnosed ADHD mm -hmm. and diagnosed ADHD. And they found that the Australian prevalence was quite conservative from in terms of world figures. I think it was around uh, between 3%, uh, you know, two, uh, I think 4% for children, 4.2% for adults. Um, and I think that normal diagnostic rates are, are quite conservative and below that in Australia. But so we are in line with the rest of the world, perhaps on the conservative side. Uh, according to a CDC study, the last one in U.S., there were 1.6 million children in, in, uh, um, in U.S. Who, who had ADD. Uh, our estimates suggest that there may be up to 4 to 5 percent of Australian adults who are undiagnosed ADD because we missed it. Uh, there were all these myths about ADD, you grow out of it, it doesn't carry on into uh, you know, mature ages and into adults, etc. So, you know, if the stats are right, then we have probably uh, a floating pool of undiagnosed ADHD adults, um, uh, you know, around the, the million mark, <laughs> to 900,000 mark. I think, I think the, uh, uh, the, the federal government is realizing it. I, I remember a chat by uh, a federal minister, I think it's Greg Hunt. Yeah, so he, he actually acknowledged that that, that uh, ADD is a big uh, health, um, you know, um, you know, burden that we haven't looked into in terms of properly diagnosing, especially in adults. And and that uh, is why it's been so difficult to line up your diary for this chat. There's a million, <laughs> there's a million people needing yeah. your services, Asha. <laughs> I, I think COVID has done that. You know, I think that uh, uh, the children who got confined to online learning. Remember, I said to you that they're ducking it because they're winging it, and so with their smartness. But when it comes to online learning, suddenly you have this huge executive challenge of regulating yourself, sticking to a screen, no interactions, time yourself. They love the sleeping in part. All ADDs love to sleep in, but they can't continue to learn from online learning because it requires too much processing power. And uh, they're used to learning in groups and, you know, as I said, uh, so when it comes to, and, and, you know, they can't question, there is no interactive, you know, stuff. So they don't like the studying part and they, 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 they because they're not learning from it, they're just studying and it all looks very regulated to them. So they get exhausted. Um, and so COVID has done that. Plus, when you look at adults, COVID has taken away all our dopamine um, supplies, you know, the travels, the um, tourist industry, the uh, the toys that we would buy, you know, limitations on exercise, uh, restrictions, social distancing. We are not fit. We are not able to exercise our fitness the way we want. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, you, I don't want to walk on the streets with a mask on as and enjoy the walk as I did before. Uh, so very, uh, you know, in terms of um, the limitations and this constant anxiety of what's next. Um, I think it's all um, brought out a lot of uh, ADD individuals who were otherwise coping because they had channeled their dopaminergic self-regulation through activities, going to office rather than Zoom, you know, yeah. you know, going on long drives, you know, traveling, getting away, you know, and just refilling their dopamine and noradrenaline, you know, circuits. And I think by by limiting that, COVID has done, um, um, you know, a big hit to ADHD, uh, you know, um, escapees. So I think the pressure on us uh, is very high. I've I've had so many people, you know, hundreds, if not in thousands who've called us to actually say that since COVID, I can't, you know, tolerate my child because there's no school, you know, mm. and what's wrong? I thought that this child was good in, in studies or in adults where a partner would call and say, I can't stand <laughs> this one because this one is just yapping and, mm. and the moods are getting affected, anxieties are high, anger, you know, so all that ADD channeled uh, and regulated uh, symptomatology uh, you know, is now brewing um, in our households. And I think that's where the burden of, uh, um, you know, um, the, the burden of health is there now. They, they, they're identifying it, they're seeking clarity. Yeah. You know, so, yeah, and I think this will get worse because as we don't get all these, these limitations keep growing, um, an ADHD brain will always take over and find dopamine no matter what. 
and if it's not exercise and sports and healthy you know things to regulate it will take you to the not so healthy mm. dopaminergic uh, you know routes uh, which can happen when you get depression anxiety fatigue exhaustion uh, you, you know it's unfortunately in our culture alcohol uh, cannabis amphetamines are short fixes uh, for ADD because they give you the burst of dopamine that you were missing you said something profound and ADHD brain will always find dopamine can you just explain the, what dopamine is and why it's so important to an yeah. ADHD yeah. individual yeah so, sorry an individual with ADHD yeah so so dopamine is one of the founding um, neurochemicals or you know proof of life form it's uh, um, it's uh, it's an essential neuropeptide or a uh, kind of a fuel that's released between cells when they talk to one another. Now it has different functions in different uh, parts of the brain. Uh, however, um, it, it without it, we would have a hard time finding purpose, uh, clarity, uh, see, make goals, think, um, uh, experience emotions, and have. Uh, an awareness uh, which allows us to exist in a, in a manner that we can execute a life as adults in a cohesive way. Um, it, while it gives us pleasure and it, you know, it allows us to regulate the moods, on the other hand, it can also um, inhibit a lot of anger, you know, a lot of uh, uh, impulsive, impulsivity-related uh, outbursts and behaviors which are self-damaging. Uh, or, or perhaps risk of standing in society. So it's inhibitory and excitatory uh, in the brain. In a very general way, dopamine uh, also tends to take care of the static of the brain. So when we have signals going in the brain, um, there are a lot of these signals are irrelevant. Um, there is a lot, a lot of white noise in the background. And so if we are getting relevant signals and we are getting irrelevant signals, dopamine takes care of the static of those signals and allows for better uh, thinking, you know, clear, clear consistency um, and a capacity to prioritize because of the static going. So it's, it's almost like there's no fog in your head. If you, uh, if you had the static, you'd get tired, you'd be foggy, you'd, you'd be dreading, you know, doing things, the motivation, the get-go, etc. The other chemical in ADHD, which is very important, is noradrenaline. And, and yeah. so the, uh, we all know about adrenaline and noradrenaline. So it affects cardiovascular system. It affects it, you know, the balance of our vagal tones as well. It's the vagal nerve tone. So noradrenaline is like, uh, uh, it's almost looking at signal quality. So while dopamine in the background is looking at the static, the adrenaline and noradrenaline you know, diet is actually making sure that all signals are going in a very smooth, clear, you know, manner from one synapse to the another. Uh, so uh, it's almost like uh, uh, having a Wi-Fi signal which stays at five bars and doesn't become NBN every now and then. <laughs> so, so, um, so that's what non-adrenaline does. So we need to have a balance of these chemicals in our system. And ADHD is when there is a, a kind of a tectronic, um, uh, you know, shift of this balance, um, and you have deficiency of one or both of these in different areas of the brain, which studies have shown over the last, you know, 20 years or so, uh, and that will result depending on where the tectonic shift is, wherever the deficiency is, it will affect the brain activity, which will then not function at the level it was supposed to. It will be an under-functioning area or that spot or that part of the brain. And this will show in your either your moods, uh, your cognitions, uh, the way we think, or in our behaviours. Mood, cognitions or behaviours. Uh, I recall it made me smile, Asha. I think I'd shared somewhere on social media that I'd completed the Ironman triathlon and your comment was that'll be enough dopamine for you for one year. <laughs> that, that, that comment did stand out. Uh, Ash, let's explore the management of ADHD. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Uh, in terms of management, and I know this is something you could speak around for all day, for uh -huh, probably uh -huh. five or six hours, uh -huh. but in general terms, uh -huh. how is ADHD managed? So it's been identified. Uh -huh. Obviously, there's plenty of people that unfortunately will go undiagnosed, but mm -hmm. someone's been diagnosed. What, mm -hmm. what are the next sort of steps? So you have 
so remember at the very um, uh, basics of it, ADHD, as I said to you earlier, is a neurochemical, neurological, developmental, neurogenetically predisposed disorder, right? Which is influenced and shaped by our environment, upbringing, etc. So the, look at the neurochemical part. So there is a treatment which is around the neurochemical imbalance that we now know happens in ADD and then it affects different brain parts, in fact brain growth uh, in the long run and and then if it's you know with brain growth everything else gets affected. So uh, medications um, will address the neurochemical aspect of ADD. Then there is the non-pharmacological treatment of ADD and really there's no better treatment in this world than psychoeducation and awareness of it. And the modern science of ADD is what we need to be educated with, uh, because there's been so many stigma and you know myth issues and uh, you know uh, misconceptions that education, education, education uh, to clarify those myths that that burden of living with something that is deemed as uh, you know a disorder of, of somebody's personality or you know somebody's um, value systems or attributes. It's not that. So we have to first look at the education and undo the stigma, the, the ignorance, the, and go back to pure science and look at the last 10,000 to 12,000 research papers over the last you know, 40 years that have now um, you know, shown that there is clear uh, biological evidence of wiring issues and a whole variety of them in different areas of the brain. So everything that you do after that from education, education continues is the one thing that should continue. And it's not education for the person, but the people who are with the person, the parents of the children, the partners of partners, the children of parents and vice versa, and etc. And schools, whoever's the stakeholder who's sharing the burden of care must be coming on board with the precise education required for what is the uniqueness and novelty of this particular child and adult and how it's affecting them. And after that, everything syncs with that. We create plans for the emotional side. If emotional dysregulation is, is an issue, we look at psychological interventions of various types, depending on the mood issue. For instance, anxiety is super prevalent. I've hardly come across somebody who didn't uh, suffer from ADD and didn't have some or another form of anxiety in some stage of their life. Uh, so then you look at the emotional issues. Some people, you know, there's I think around 20% prevalence of depression, 18 to 20% prevalence of anxiety. Uh, we know that drug addiction is very high. Most common diagnosis in children who are not diagnosed with ADD is the, the you know, oppositional conduct disorders and oppositional defiant disorders. So they kind of become branded as the nasty, you know, mm. naughty mm. child that, you know, nobody wants to you know, manage, and, and, and same with adults, you know, anger management issues, you know, start to happen, uh, relationships, uh, you know, people are uh, going to feel uh, self-esteem corrosion and self-doubting becomes, um, you know, a huge part of a person's life. They, they go back to their life and self-doubting, anxiety, avoidance, and therefore frustration, anger, and, you know, saying things they don't mean. So we then look at that emotional profile and we look at treating that, whether it's psychologically, plus uh, either antidepressants, anti-anxieties. Um, then we look at the behavioral profile, I'm just summarizing it, yeah. which would be how has this affected him? You know, people get into car accidents, you know. Uh, a person with ADD will lose their driving license at least twice in, in a lifetime. If, if there's no DUIs, they'll be speeding tickets and so on. So the, the social, you know, relationships, uh, you know, job losses, trialing one degree, then another degree, then getting bored, then another job, another job, etc. So you're looking at that social, so you formulate the social side and then you tailor treatment according to that. You know, if there's grief issue, loss issue, I often see families, you know, burnt out, you know, and, and living in their own silos of burnout and, mm -hmm. and with so much confusion, not knowing why, you know, what happened to this person. So we then create that kind of a socio-emotional profile and we cater to that, be it, uh, you know, if it's problems in school, there's, you know, uh, there's aggression at school, etc. we then involve the school and we cater to that. So we look at the behavioral, uh, you know, issues and we do behavioral um, interventions such as cognitive behavioral therapy. Uh, we can do a behavioral profile uh, with a behavioral psychologist for ADDs 
uh, th such as you know, uh, uh, you know, there's a therapy called ABA. Uh, there's a therapy called functional behavioral analysis. So we can do all of those, and then we can do an education profile and see what the struggles are there. And accordingly, then you do the therapies. And and at the uh, so these are more social interventions. You know, involving stakeholders, looking at individual education plans. You know, behaviors. How are they being responded to? So creating parenting supports. Parents are often missed. You know how to deal with this behavior. If a child is angry, it's probably because they have ADD and they're exhausted. So don't push them at that time. So think simple things like those. Mm -hmm. You know, look at the antecedents of certain behaviors. Look at rewards. You know, look at positive reframing. Um, and 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 so that is the social part. You know, in relationships, you talk to partners, and you say, no, uh, he's just. Uh, you know, this is an ADD burnout. You know, he he, he You know, they, they're trying hard, but it's not happening. The third part is obviously the uh, cognitive part, which is then, so you've got the emotional part, social, and then the cognitive part depends. So you can have cognitive, re you know, there are many kinds of therapies, but one of the most important ones nowadays is ADHD coaching, which is really good for ADDs because they liked the pragmatism, the problem solving. It's like a, a solution focused uh, coping uh, enhancement intervention. So the ADHD coach is actually an executive function coach. And you go to them and you say, okay, my biggest problems in life are I can't, I'm always running late, I'm always, <laughs> always rushing, I'm always, uh, my head is racing, uh, I lose my prioritization, my boss is pissed off, etc., etc." So the ADHD coach will take those set of ADHD behaviors and will work to coach you in what alternatives do you have. First, they will you know, kind of formulate what is ADD and what's, you know, not, and then they will give you what evidence-based strategies are best. And it could be simple tweaking. Uh, talk about exercise, you know, I can't do exercise, I can't be, you know, motivated. So the ADHD coach will talk to you about delegating time, creating variety, looking at interests, and will perhaps say, look, ADDs work best if it's one-to-one, -one. okay? So whenever you have a coach or a person who's doing your exercise, you will be motivated better because ADDs get a lot of noradrenaline when there's accountability, you know, or they get dopamine when there is reward. So if, a, if there's a good intelligent coach, you know, they'll work better. So ADHD coaching is very good for cognitive kind of, uh, you know, aspects of ADD. Um, and then you can have many other types of neuropsychologists who do interventions, neurofeedback, there's a lot of complementary therapies. Sleep, for instance, is a chronic problem um, in, in, in these individuals which makes you so sluggish in the morning, you're never waking up fresh. So we do interventions for sleep, we investigate that, find out there's a very high preponderance of sleep apnea or circadian uh, you know, rhythm problems and physiological sleep problems in ADD because the ADD mind is just, is just active. Uh, the, the problem with ADD mind is the more tired the body is, the mind is more active. The more tired you are and the more bored you are, uh, you know, normally I would want to sleep, but the ADD mind in boredom is just racing. You know, wow. it wants to, it can't shut down. So you can't have your sleep architecture. So we look at the, so the point being that you work on a cognitive, emotional and behavioral framework of pharmacological and non-pharmacological treatments. I probably have kind of uh, dragged this on because I'm a advocate of uh, doing these interventions not in a kind of a uh, very generic way but looking at all these factors formulating the uniqueness and the impact of these in every domain for the person and the family and the stakeholders and then create an intervention customized to that that's why I gave you a whole uh, 40 books in that last 20 minutes, <laughs> and, and you can wake up now, yes. <laughs> no, I was not asleep, Ash. I'm <laughs> frantically kidding. writing notes. <laughs> kind of no, a few things jumped out <laughs> there. Uh, uh, the When the body's tired, the brain can be racing. That's mm, mm. fascinating. Yeah. I've observed that uh, with certain individuals over the years. Yeah, yeah. How is that so? Is that a yeah, physiological... Yeah, yeah it's, it is. So... Remember um, that we are all interconnected. Everything is sitting on a neurofeedback or feedback loop, right? The mind, brain, body. So, uh, so in, remember ADD is basically an aberration or, or a uh, discrepancy or a deficit in the um, neural circuit involving noradrenaline and dopamine, okay? So, uh, so remember I said to you that a dopamine deficient brain will somehow 
learn to compensate for the deficiency. It yeah. can't allow you to go downhill. So either during the daytime it's going to make you busy. You know, you're going to be chatty. You're going to want to do something. You'll go for a quick run and you, you want to do the next two minutes and you'll get your child to do some running exercises so they can do homework, etc., etc., right? But when it comes to um, the second half of the day, we are not, we are a little limited, <laughs> you know, with those channeling out of, uh, you know, self-coping uh, mechanism. So uh, unfortunately, uh, other than alcohol and other substances which allow relief to, you know, to get a person to feel that it numbs myself, you know, uh, the brain has no other choice except to release um, uh, a noradrenaline or adrenaline um, um, uh, because it can't find dopamine anymore, right? So the problem in ADD is in a, in a kind of a nutshell that mm. the because of the... Um, it's not so regulated, that response, that you kind of get flooded with adrenaline. So adrenaline and noradrenaline and some other amines are very closely linked to dopamine. So, the, so it's like not having 98 octane, I'll, I'll release some 91 octane or ethanol fuel into your system because I can't find 98 octane, which was running you through the day. Now with your turbo engines, when you get the um, it's it's a kind of a it's it's not the best match uh, because it is your reserve fuel adrenaline and non adrenaline as it comes to compensate, and that's when the head is going adrenergic. So you go into a threat mode, you go into a defcon mode. You must do things, and find things so it pushes you to think, do, or get into things so that you can find pleasure and then novelty again, and at least temporarily go to you know get your dopamine back. So it's like. A brain is caught up in this kind of a, a reaction, you know, and in a very reactive way to its own dopamine adrenergic crisis. And, uh, and then often people, the brain gets tired. And if you have genetic predisposition, the brain says, well, I'm just going to activate your, um, uh, in, in very simple ways, you know, the anxiety gene predisposition or the depressive gene, and then the adrenaline comes with that. So that's why a lot of people get anxious. They're often seen as fidgety, restless, you know, agitated, you know, not settling. I mean, their partners are saying, what the hell, you're on a date with me? Where, you know, where are you lost, you know, forgetful. So that anxiety then becomes uh, activated and it was served to be activated to feed the drop in dopamine but now once it's activated, it's activated. Mental health mm. genetic activation is now there. So now you're dealing with a double whammy of, 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 of dealing with the anxiety, which was actually supposed to be just adrenaline to compensate for the, <laughs> for the dopamine. For, for the worn out <laughs> supply of dopamine. <laughs> for the day. Supply, yeah. So it, now you've got permanent supply because please be anxious. Mm. And then panic and all of those things. It just, anxiety is the key to all bad mental health evil in my view wow so, so and before we move on to exercise mm -hmm. these individuals is it fair to say that they might need to fall asleep exhausted by correct they don't go to sleep restfully correct it's you go to sleep when you're exhausted 100 percent. i mean it's an exhaustive sleep it's not a refreshing mm. restoring sleep and that's why ADD individuals, when they wake up, they're not fresh. Mm. They are the children. It's a torture for them. I mean, talk to parents about how, I mean, my hat's off to them, how they get an ADD child out of bed, get them dressed, get them into school in time. You know, they're, those parents, you know, uh, wow, so how they manage this. So they're, they're battling against neurochemical, unrefreshed, unrestored brain. And just imagine that child then sitting in school from 8.30 till three o'clock, not able to move from his seat, not having enough dopamine, and you know, forced to comply with all the structures and routines. So when they come back, just imagine the level of exhaustion from dopamine, everything depletion in them. No wonder they go crazy, you know, when they come home and, you know, they, they, and then the parents get, you know, what's wrong? He behaves in school, but he's, uh, wow. he's, wow. he's not behaving at, at, at home, so yeah. So it kind of, and that same thing with adults, because, uh, you know, in the household, you, you find the depleted part. Coming back to the sleep part, look, one of the theories of sleep is that sleep restoration requires a certain architecture of sleep, certain stages, five cycles of sleep architecture, norm, and, you know, if you do EEGs, you, you kind of look for delta waves, which is where brain actually reboots itself. So millions of cells which die every day are kind of, you know, uh, reformed or reborn 
and they happen at a certain time of a sleep cycle and when you are sleeping with residue of all days of toxic residue of adrenaline in your system and and no dopamine you're not going to have the perfect sleep architecture so that brain repair that was supposed to happen doesn't get fully repair and so you don't wake up with a firmware update you are still running on old firmware and bits of the update you know like we Mm, get on our so so that if imagine that happening for years you know so that will have consequences on a person's mental health physical health you know relationships you know social outlook self-esteem you know and so on and so forth yeah so it sounds like it's a lifelong management uh challenge yeah and with it being so so many moving parts that can affect mm-hmm. it and life being life it comes with its challenges its mm-hmm. crises mm-hmm. uh I just sort of picture in what a challenge it is to steward someone across a whole lifespan successfully absolutely it's a challenge and it's a burden because you don't know that you're carrying this burden so if you knew only then you could have done something about it uh, we know that uh, adhd peaks you know into teenage years and 20s and then it it starts to um you know we believe that it doesn't peak after that it just plateaus is it that it's plateauing or we are getting just we adapt to it mm. after taking the hits of it you know we 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 recognize that this is who we were and we just adapt to the new um new normal without knowing what my best normal was mm. you know and and you know if you look at these add individuals whenever they lose jobs relationships you know career choices that they change and through school years you will always find that the uh, observers always said has the potential but cannot uh, does not seem to apply it mm. you know they will always be seen as someone who was smart smarter than what they turned out to be or what their life shows even when there's relationship conflict the partner says he's a good guy you know but he really you know i can't understand you know why this toxicity why this change in behaviors there's an unexplained question mark in teachers and observers and parents saying i know this at the core of it is the sweetest you know nicest person this kid is brilliant what is wrong you know scaleless mistakes you know Uh, no time management no prioritization such obstinate behavior such boisterousness where is this coming from mm-hmm. so yeah it becomes a lifelong thing but i think that eventually the sad news is that some of them will just say that is me you mm-hmm. know and will just carry on dealing with that confusion that self doubting in in their own way they just adapt mm-hmm. uh, they go through adapting to maladapting to adapting and then i think you just get tired uh, when I, when i see a lot of people i especially youngsters in your age group etc i i i i i tell them look there is no diagnosis for this in psychiatric books but you have what is called a burnout depression uh, you know adds have this burnout depression where, where where they run out of fuel and motivation everything is an effort uh, so uh, and and so the the sadness and despair is not the depression depression and Uh, but it's uh, it's this motivational depression i have nothing left in me you yeah. know everything is an effort so so that's the struggle in life the motivation i think will stay the self doubting all these things just become latent you know mm. i think but the burden just remains buried it's there you're listening to this expert edition on all things adhd exercise and sport featuring specialist psychiatrist director queensland adhd neurosciences clinic dr asha khan support for today's show comes from the great folk and incredible product range at precision hydration i spoke to andy blow from precision hydration co-founder on the show during expert edition episode 234 on all things hydration science where i was surprised to learn that there isn't a one size fits all approach to hydration this is simply because everybody loses a different amount of sweat with a different salt concentration i got a sweat test through the team at precision hydration and it turned out that i only lose about half the amount that the average athlete loses in their sweat If you've ever struggled with hydration issues like cramp during long hot sessions, it's worth checking out precisionhydration.com. If you can't get to a test center like I did, you can take the free online sweat test to get a personal hydration strategy to test in training. 
And now the team at Precision Hydration are aiming to do for fueling what they've done for hydration by helping you understand how much carbohydrate you need to perform at your best. Take Precision Hydration's quick carb calculator to get a fueling recommendation and then book a free one-to-one video consultation with the team to refine your hydration and fueling strategy for your next race. It is so important to know your fueling numbers and you can use the all-new Precision Fuel 30 Gels and Precision Fuel 30 Drink Mix to ensure you hit your fueling numbers. Each product contains 30 grams of carbohydrates per serving to make it easier for you to keep track of your intake and ensure you're getting enough fuel in to perform at your best during your races and training sessions. Now, as a listener of The Physical Performance Show, you can get 15% off your first order of Precision Hydration Electrolytes and the new Precision Fuel Range by using the code TPPS at checkout over at precisionhydration.com. Support for today's show also comes from our upcoming live stream event featuring UK-based sports dietitian and author Rinny McGregor, fueling the endurance athlete. This live stream is set for September the 4th, 3 to 6 p.m., Brisbane, Australia time. However, do not despair. If you're outside of that time zone, a post-event recording and full copies of the lecture via PDFs will be made available to every registrant. During the live stream, Rini will cover four key learning modules. Rini will define what exactly we are referring to by endurance athlete. Rini will debunk common myths around fueling, including why lighter is not always faster. Rini will outline why it is that we must treat male and female athletes differently. And Rini will explore the common pitfalls around being in a state of low energy availability. Of course, as per all physical performance show live stream events there will be a q and a section as well to secure your ticket to this upcoming live stream learning opportunity jump over to pogophysio.com.au forward slash rinny mcgregor live stream and there you can gain access from 49 dollars australian per registrant Now, if you are a Physical Performance Show's Learnings member through Patreon, then the good news is access to all of our live stream events, our entire back catalogue, including Dr. Stephen Seiler and Dr. Shona Halson, is yours as a complimentary gift. You can support the show via a Patreon membership from just $5 per month by jumping over to Patreon and searching The Physical Performance Show. And of course, support for today's show comes from Pogo Physio's online telehealth consultations if you are an endurance athlete struggling with bone tendon or joint related concerns our 45 minute online telehealth consultations are an ideal way to help get you back to your physical best here's a success story from sarah tasmanian based recreational competitive triathlete who overcame some persisting bone related foot pain Hey, I'm Sarah. I'm a competitive age group triathlete from Australia and telehealth 100% works. I did telehealth with Brad for chronic sesamoiditis and I didn't need any hands-on treatment. I had exercise prescription and load management with my training and this along with Brad's expertise and genuine care got me across my pogo finish line. Thanks, Sarah. If you'd like a hand with your running-related injury, jump over to pogophysio.com.au forward slash telehealth. For now, let's jump back with this week's expert edition featuring specialist psychiatrist, director and founder of the Queensland ADHD and Neurosciences Clinic, Dr. Asha Khan, on all things ADHD, exercise and sport. Asha, we've you've been sharing around some of the burden of mm-hmm. ADHD. Mm-hmm. I've heard it said that ADHD isn't a diagnosis; it's a gift. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, it's a very sort of <laughs> loose statement in many ways. Mm-hmm. But uh, what are some of the? I mean, before we press record, you were sharing some of the world's best athletes that mm-hmm. everyone would identify: mm-hmm. Michael mm-hmm. Phelps, Michael Jordan, Justin Gatlin, mm-hmm. some outstanding athletes mm-hmm. with incredible track records Mm -hmm. you know the best of the best really Mm -hmm. uh what are some of the the manifestations that are helpful with adhd is it a gift or is it a burden combination (laughs) well i I, look i don't i think that the um 
I don't think there are any studies or science to support that it's a gift. It's it's a neurogenetic, neurochemical um, developmental disorder. Okay, so uh, I I think that it can, if you're living with it, and um, it it will depend on who you're with, what your life environment, resources, education. For instance, we know in studies that there's less prevalent burden of ADD in high socioeconomic classes where parents were not separated as opposed to single separated you know parents when a child is raised by one parent we know socioeconomic earning status education status all these things matter in ADD so really you know if Michael Phelps didn't have that mother you know who was on his back and you know and 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 was consistent I mean she then how many people have Michael Phelps type of parents who will dedicate themselves and commit themselves to a one-to-one, -one, um, you know, um, literally the, the, the life is, you know, spent raising a champion. So, um, plus he was in the U.S., you know, uh, would we have a, a child in an Australian school, you know, who would go off ADD treatment and would go completely crazy, aggressive, boisterous. I mean, look at Michael Phelps' behaviors, you know. That school tolerated it. They didn't kick him out. They got, they found that he's channeling into uh, water is his medium and he gets opioids from this. So they cultivated him, right? But how many of our schooling systems are equipped to be tolerant of such outliers, uh, you know, when we are younger? You know, it's such a regulated system. Uh, that doesn't allow or doesn't, you know, has no tolerance for these outlying behaviors. You can't go to school and say, I'm off my medications. I mean, the parents will just keep getting letters from school saying not behaving. I mean, I have children getting suspended for, you know, simpler things just because they were intrigued and they wanted to be accepted. They just, you know, did a behavior in the influence of a peer group and they get suspensions. So, you know, we are a very regulated, in a majority, I'm not talking about all schools, we, we are also, our resources are not the best, uh, you know, our people do a good job, but, so not everyone gets a Michael Phelps genius, potential, genetics, frontal cortex, and a mother, okay, you know, and we don't know of the struggles that he went through, the emotional, the cognitive, the social struggles he probably had to face, um, uh, you know, and, and I mean, in, in my opinion, he, he, you know, there's also other, some sensory issues going on because he felt calm in water, so there's more going on, so I think in the same way, for instance, we take Michael Jordan, so we know that ADD individuals, in order to battle distraction, learn to hyper-focus, right? So. I don't know whether I'd like to call it a gift that he became a, just because he became a champ. It probably was the case that his hyper-focusing capacity uh, made him a great champ. You know, he was able to score and so on because in those moments in time, he could just kind of zone, you know, completely take out all the noise and go into super focus. That's why ADDs are very good first-line responders, you know coaches, you know, paramedics, you know, doctors and emergency department, nurses in emergency, and so on, so pilots, you know, etc. So, so I think that because the adrenaline pours in to counter the dopamine going down and it puts you into this hyper-focus mode, and when you have so much adrenaline and you're in a do or die, you know, kind of a, then your crisis management is better, you learn better, you think better, because now you're in that DEFCON 1 mode of adrenergic survival because you, the rest of you is crashing. So once again, you know, your brain is hyper aroused because it's getting deactivated from ADD and all you need is environmental cues, something of interest um, and stimuli and rewards and the seeking of reward to get you going again. So uh, basically that's how they perform, but that segment should not be seen as a gift for life, I mm. think, because that talent becomes a gift. Yes. But what about the rest of you? Yeah. You know, all the internal struggles of your life, emotional struggles, yes. people. What if you didn't have that glory? How many of us become Michael Phelps and Jordans? <laughs> yeah, wow, that's fascinating. Because high perform. I mean, you look at people that achieve extraordinary things. You use the word outliers and clearly everyone identifies a Michael Jordan and a Michael Phelps as history's arguably greatest outliers in sport. Uh, 
just they have to see the world differently. They have to experience it differently. Differently. They have to think differently. And mm-hmm. you know, there's been some good documentary, like mm-hmm. you know, the last yep. st- dancer. I think mm-hmm. it was called with Michael Jordan. And mm-hmm. I think everyone found That's, that fascinating. Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. what you just shared, I think, is incredible. In order to battle a distraction, the distraction that comes with ADHD that individual learned to hyper focus yeah and surely that hyper focus helps when it comes to highest level of performance in absolutely. whatever the whatever the task yeah, academics yeah, as absolutely. you said first line responders sports so what prevalence is there amongst you know athletes i mean this, there might not be any research around this yeah. asha but do you would you look at high-performing individuals in sport and often suspect that there's elements or diagnosed or undiagnosed ADHD present? Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. I think there is research. Um, I was just looking at a paper this morning because of you, um, because of this interview, uh, where I even found out that in elite athletes, um, studies have shown that the prevalence could be up to 18 to 20 percent. I was taken aback by this number because I've, you know, been practicing in the five to six percent uh, kind of the zone. So I think another study that I just found had an eight point one percent, you know, prevalence up to the age of uh, nineteen years in seventeen studies. So it's very high uh, kind of prevalences. Um, and I also found that, um, but but in my everyday clinical life, when I see. Uh, my my uh, exercise loving patients and sport patient you know they're usually uh, of that smarter group you know and they are um, um, they are using hyper focus to pull through to to get through to life okay so they're super super productive super sharp but exercise is regulating them you know sports is regulating them I see a lot of them however uh, at the same time when you look at studies they come to me because as per the science they have the high level of stress depression anxiety substance use disorders um, that uh, while they can block out the distractions during practice and competition with the hyper focus um, nobody has actually measured and studied that hyper focus part Um, but that hyper focus remember when life changes a new uh, battles come along, personal life and so on, that person who's been working so hard is going to struggle with the change. Mm-hmm. When you change this milieu that was sustaining them, mm-hmm. when a job changes, uh, relationship changes, they struggle and that's when I see them at that cr- crux in life where change or crisis has rattled them and ADD catches up with them. And this is where panic, anxiety, depression and burnout uh, you know, are the uh, for most common symptoms that they experience. And in real life, it's always, almost always a social impact, you know, relationships and stand, social standing, finances, you know, addiction, etc. And if exercise is sustaining them, it makes me think of my work as a practicing mm-hmm. physiotherapist mm-hmm. where an individual like this sustains an injury mm-hmm. and, let's say, a bone stress injury and they cannot run. Mm-hmm. And without the tools of your training... Mm-hmm. Instinctively, you know that that individual's greatest struggle is not going to be the physical pain mm-hmm. that they're enduring because of the injury. It's the psychological dysregulation or whatever the term might be. They mm-hmm. they struggle, and mm-hmm. you can't help but empathise with mm-hmm. that. Being I, before I came to meet you today, there's a uh, super bike champion who mm-hmm. had a fairly nasty injury and Mm -hmm. uh he's looking at probably a year or two of Mm -hmm. recovery and Mm -hmm. he's sitting in the wheelchair Mm -hmm. in the Mm -hmm. room just with his legs pumping Mm -hmm. because he's just needing to move Mm -hmm. and i thought wow this is going to be a long journey Mm -hmm. so Mm -hmm. it really is a great example of Mm -hmm. how if exercise is taken away from someone they they really do struggle yeah any practical examples of that obviously all patient details are confidential yeah yeah. uh but any examples uh of, of you know, an individual that has exercised all their life and all of a sudden it's taken away and how that's manifest? I mean, I, I, I've only had two proper, three or two, two to three percent properly people who are as uh, professionally athletic and so on. But uh, whenever, it's, it probably is the other side that I see. I see people who haven't um, sustained uh, involvement in exercise um, because, the, you see, exercise is boring. So the ADD brain is not going to be going towards exercise naturally till there is incentive, a good coach, 
uh, a good motivation and or they have some role modeling rewards they have some rewards that's what incentives and right. and so um, so uh, the people with ADD actually start to do the exercise when they learn about their ADD they say, oh my god am I missing out on the world's greatest treatment you know? <laughs> so uh, we have amazing studies amazing brain studies on exercise and uh, you know so Kramer started this I mean Kramer I think it was an um, Illinois study landmark study where he showed that if you actually and this is not in ADD people but normal people that if you walk uh, you know for 40 minutes or six years for three days a week for up to six months he actually showed through scans how your brain prefrontal cortex actually changes it grows your prefrontal cortex which is the main you know, target area for ADD as well, where all the dopamine and everything is regulating, all the circuits are coming from there. It's called the CEO of the brain. And, and, and it actually shows it grows. You know, there are studies to show that while short-term effects of cardiac, cardio exercises are better than non-cardio exercises, the, there's brain actual studies to confirm that amazing stuff happening in there. You know, the synapses are releasing, you know, factors called BDNF, brain, you know, nerve growth factors. Vagal tone is increasing. Uh, signals, you know, improve. And in the long term, if you do these things, then the effects are lasting and they're more not in the neurons and the quality of transmission, but the long term effect exercise, actual brain changes happen. Actual neurological growth. And kind of the brain recalibrates itself to its uh, optimal best, uh, you know. So the, in ADD, we have enough proof that it should be a first line, you know, treatment. And I see people who, because they are suffering, just imagine I gave you the example uh, to invoke some empathy in you of that child who has to wake up unrefreshed and go through school what time has he, I mean, how, how will he actually come and uh, what has he left in him mm. <laughs> to, he's just going to go his PlayStation, mm. he's, do, he's, going to, he's going to do his Fortnite mm. and, and, and Minecraft because he's got nothing left and all he can do is just play with a joystick and get his dopamine going with a hyper focus and do really well in Fortnite, right? Yes. So we are not, so we have to identify sports during school times and, and make them very targeted it's essential because the child is there's nothing left afterwards same for an adult with ADD there's not much left in him when he comes home I mean and then there's the um, you know the non-cardiac exercises which is like yoga and Tai Chi and so on so uh, even those are better than nothing you know um, there are some studies also to suggest that the more complex the exercise which requires more coordination uh, tasking shifting attention scheming you know the better the effect on brain growth, actual brain growth and brain st stability. Um, so um, so the, the, there was a difference between cardiac and non-cardiac. So cardiac are the ones where you perspire, as you know, and, you know, and then there is the complex and the non-complex, the more coordinated and the non-coordinated. Mm. Uh, so they also have, the, the higher the complexity, as uh, like people in Taekwondo and you know, martial arts and all of that combined with sports, is going to have much amazing cognitive and executive refresh rate and performance than than your standard. But they will also improve. But yeah. but the more you hit the prefrontal cortex and 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 stimulate the wiring, yes. the the better your ADHD beneficial effects will be. Yeah. The better your brain growth will be. Wow! So exercise really is a absolutely huge. fundamental, huge, irrefutably important part of ADHD yeah. management across the lifespan. Across the lifespan, I mean, as a uh, the uh, the brain is growing in the first part, so it's really essential, you know, in the first part because you can shape the brain, mm. uh, you know, the way you want. I mean, you know that there's studies to suggest that in a growing child and even in adults, um, ADD effects, uh, you know, exercise effects, uh, you know, the part of the brain where all the dread, threat, and fright and fight signals come from, which is where the uh, monoamines or adrenalines created locus serialis in the brainstem. And they find that children have better eye contact. They have better, they don't react, you know, in a hypervigilant way. Yes. They don't frighten easily. They don't startle that easily. And translate that into adults, 
that means you will be less likely to have road rage if you are exercising and you're going to be less likely to you'll be more tolerant yeah. of of you know absorbing it's actually all that i'm saying to you is scientifically you know proven uh, i mean john rady in harvard has done a lot of work in this um, um, you know so so they they so all of these effects of exercise will continue through lifespan but it'll be different for a growing child, you yes. know, and perhaps more beneficial because it sets the conditioning. And then different for adults, you know, in terms of relapse prevention of anxiety, you know, all the losses and hits that they take. You're listening to Dr. Asha Khan, specialist psychiatrist and director and founder of the Queensland ADHD and Neurosciences Clinic on this expert edition on all things ADHD, exercise and sport. If you missed last week's episode, it was a featured performer episode featuring Australian triathlon great Greg Bennett. Greg shared the highs, lows and learnings of his remarkable 28-year professional triathlon career. Highs included clean sweeping, the richest triathlon prize purse in history at the Lifetime Fitness Grand Slam in the US, while lows included narrowly missing selection for the Australian Olympic team for the Sydney 2000 triathlon at the Olympic Games. The learnings were fast and furious, and there were some terrific stories thrown into the mix as well. It's been an incredibly popular featured performer episode. Here's a little snippet of my conversation with Greg Bennett from last week's episode. Success comes to those who you know, endure just one moment longer. Mm. And what I mean by that is this turn up consistency every single day, do the hard work, do the right work is probably better than hard work because you never know what's just around the corner. You know, something is better than nothing. To enjoy the full episode featuring Greg Bennett, be sure to jump over to wherever it is that you enjoy the physical performance show from. You'll find us now also over on YouTube. Whilst there, peruse the archives that in right back to episode one, featuring surf life-saving Ironman champion, Ali Day. For now, let's jump back with this week's Expert Edition guest, Dr. Asha Khan, specialist psychiatrist, director of Queensland ADHD and Neurosciences Clinic on all things ADHD, exercise and sport. Asha... You've shared so generously uh, Mm -hmm. thus far, and I know there's so many more avenues that we could explore with this, Mm -hmm. but in in bringing into a few practical tips, uh, thinking about the listenership of this show, which is athletes, coaches, practitioners, uh, maybe going to push you for a top tip for each of those groups. Mm -hmm. Uh, So maybe a top tip for practitioners, and we're not defining what type of practitioner that is, but someone working in the healthcare setting Mm -hmm. uh, for assisting people with either diagnose or perhaps undiagnosed mm-hmm. ADHD. Yeah, look at look at the. <laughs> I have not done this to coaches and executives. You guys probably live it and know more about these sciences than I do. Uh, but from a very basic clinical perspective, um, you can help by identifying the individuals. Um, address some of the stigma and the ignorance because they, they, the, the fear is out there from the confusion. And uh, if you get to know your people, I think you should look at a couple of things such as, you know, do they, you know, I, I'm sure that when they come to you in your one-to-ones, there's a lot of catharsis that goes on. I mean, I go, you know, my hairdresser says everyone talks to me and my head is spinning. So when they come to you on that table, they're obviously connected to you. You know them, you know their backgrounds. And if you find that their their brilliance is not and their values and their actual uh, the, the the soul of who they are is 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 not reflected uh, in their life and and that you know other than exercise they're they're not too many self regulatory outside of that zone they crash they struggle i think it's a uh, it's a good point to think maybe to get, get to see uh, and and see if the family has a history of that a child is struggling um, or, you know, um, because ADHD is very neurogenetic, you know, it runs in families and almost 70, 80 wow. percent. So, um, so kind of start talking about the, the concept of ADD. And, and remember, high functioning ADD, people who are high functioners are masking it and they've got exercise and uh, triathlons and 
gym work and good diets, they're regulating it. But you will still see over a period of time that they struggle in applying their best. They mm -hmm. have, they're happy with the norm, but there was a best normal that they came to terms with that they never tapped into consistently mm -hmm. uh, without effort. So look at those individuals, talk to them. Um, they will almost always have uh, perhaps uh, a very different kind of a profile exercise will be a lot more therapeutic for them in their headspace, not just in their physical self. Yes. Uh, they will talk to you about how their focus, concentration, organizing is contingent on, you know, <laughs> exercise in a very therapeutic way, kind of over that, you know, threshold where I would get exercise and say, okay, I feel cool and young and, you know. Uh, so uh, they, they would actually, you will see that there's a healing effect of exercise on them a bit beyond, yeah. you know, which takes them into an optimal zone. And without that, and, ta and then imagine them without the coaching and uh, that you give them that they would crash if it was not in their life. So that's a little yeah. uh, kind of a hint that you should look further. And then look at the effort of their life. They're also prone to injuries. They're prone to accidents. They're prone to uh, those uh, sickies. They're prone to time management problems. They'll be the ones running late. They'll be the ones who will be missing out and canceling and then apologizing like crazy. They'll be ones who will be rushing in always in the last minute and have anxiety and saying, sorry, I'm running late. <laughs> and then, and then they'll, be the, you know, and they'll be the ones most apologetic and kindest and nicest, but they'll also be very sensitive in, in many ways. And, and uh, that sensitivity uh, does, does uh, if you have this one-to-one -one therapeutic relationship with them, you'll find that profile, that they're such nice people, sensitive. Um, and and you know they, the, so yeah. If you can if you can talk to them, and the three things to look for is their lifelong history of struggles with uh, getting bored because they got inattentive, you know, or they got is there a history of doing so well but s impulsively messing up, <laughs> you know, every now and then there are some blips in one or other area of your life and injuring yourself, taking on these drastic ups and downs of life with hyper excitable zones impulsively doing things which is completely out of character <laughs> and completely you know going into a crash and guilt and what have I done and you know messing up so a kind of an auto destruct self sabotaging button every now and then that gets activated do they go into defcon ones and go into high anxious panic threat modes you know so there'll be this very interesting you know kind of volatility of sorts which is makes them very interesting as well they're the world's most interesting people <laughs> and then they uh, but it, it is their burden really so help them out and see that the lifelong patterns of applying yourself uh, to the fullest without effort uh, without as much effort the uh, inattentiveness the impulsivity and are they uh, you know in the terms of inhibiting themselves are they able to stop you know, they, they, they know their boundaries. They know what not to say. They know what not to commit to. If you have the three eyes uh, of those symptoms then, and if it's through life and school reports and others' observations, as I said, show smart, but able, not showing how, you know, smarter can you be, then you can help that person to go see a specialist and a, and a psychologist. So give them literature from Russell Barkley, one of the easiest literatures to read at, you know, on YouTube. Uh, Russell Barkley has an excellent talk uh, on um, ADHD uh, transitions or ADHD and emotions or ADHD and relationships. So have a look at that talk uh, or, or by Edward Hallowell. Amazing YouTube stuff out there. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and watch out for the girls and women. They get missed. Remember, three guys are getting picked up for one girl. So yes. that girl patient of yours or that client of yours is going to be a masker. So she will be, she's missed. Everyone has missed her because of her apparent functioning. So, uh, you know, so remember, she'll be the more inattentive and she has winged it because she psychologically learn to people please and conform and has a high degree of intellect you know to have coped so it'll be much more difficult as as is with clinicians to pick up the high functioning female wow uh, asha and and something i must ask something that i feel this knowing you personally you've almost uh, edified me around is my absolute love of exercise and the need to survive with it largely and uh it brings up something that I often hear in my work, and that is people being almost criticised for their seeming 
they might even say, oh, I cop a bit of flack because I just I'm addicted to exercise, mm. and they almost feel some sense of shame mm. around it. Mm. Speaking to people like you over the years, which has been a real blessing, it's uh, you, you've, you've helped me as a therapist, practitioner, physio realize that well, this can be people's sustenance through life, and it is not to be poo pooed for certain, yeah. you know for individuals. So, I mean, it, it, yeah. anything you'd share around that, just liberating the person that maybe thinks this is a bad thing, I can't yeah. stop doing this. Absolutely, I, I mean, you, but but you can't because th- 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 there is. Um, as I said to you, you're an autopilot. I mean, our mind-brain-body connections are driven by some evolutionary, some genetics, some socially reinforced, some environmental. We are regulated beings, and we have to survive. And um, and so the brain will uh, make you survive. You run, and your heart rate does come down. Your blood pressure does settle. Your breathing rate d- does go to 12 to 17 a minute, no matter if it's 36, you know, two minutes before. So our brain is uh, constantly regulating ourselves. And that's why exercise, the, one of the best studies is that when they started looking at the role of sports and exercise was through, they looked at the impact on Wegel, the Wegel nerve, um, you know, stimulation and conditioning. And they found, wow, you know, exercise, the the... the uh, the cord or the uh, wiring that it is uh, connected or plugged in is through the vagal nerve. So vagal nerve is the regulatory nerve, mm. heart rate, cardiovascular, mm. you know the deal, right? Breathing. So so exercise is an essential component, ADD or not ADD. I've given you enough evidence today to show its impact on ADD brains, but also non-ADD brains. There's no way that you're going to miss out. but. When it comes to ADD, um, that addictive part that comes in is actually perhaps, perhaps uh, sustained by a brain trying to salvage your quality of life, giving you adaptive survival skills, allowing you to stay and evolve, um, you know, because it's the way we are tuned. Uh, right? Mm. And so, I mean, the brain has its own right and wrongs. It has the two parts. One is the logical part, and the other part is the contextual part, which gives you perspective. Without these two talking, you won't have purpose, you won't have values, you won't have goals. So, the brain is an amazing, amazing piece of, you know, one to three billion <laughs> wires, and, and it's constantly doing it. So, that addictive capacity is not the addiction that we see. So, when ADD people come to me and say, You know, I've been drinking and to regulate myself for cannabis and and whatnot, or workaholism or gambling or pornography, I say to them, that's addictive behavior. That's not addiction as a disease. And they're branded all over the hospitals and everywhere else as addicts, but they're not. So this, but just because it's sports, they won't be branded as addicts because it's a good thing. So part of that addictive behavior Mm. is your self-survival as it is mine to get up and eat or breathe, okay? And so it could be looked at as having an addictive quality. Yes. But then basically you're saying, I'm addicted to surviving, which is kind of, you know. A good thing. <laughs> yes, <it's laughs> the most normal thing well, that, that, that you have. You well, I think you've liberated many <laughs> listeners out there, Asha. So uh, thank you. And every guest, finally, Asha, issues listeners with a physical challenge for the week. So yeah. you can take this into your own expertise and field but what what are you going to challenge listeners to do this week i'm going to get them to uh, it's, a, it's got to be a physical challenge is it well as i say that we can, psychiatry, well, i, I realize the irony in that <laughs> <laughs> you, you make the challenge uh, okay what you like the physical challenge is <laughs> that um uh, uh, you know ask yourself sit down uh 90 minutes after your exercise and uh, our sports session 90 minutes after that and give yourself a physical challenge of being in a boring place with nothing to do and uh, 90 minutes later when the opioids of the exercise in sports will settle hopefully (laughs) not for the lifelong ones because their opioids don't settle you know but usually 90 minutes after the morning exercise session 
uh, succumb yourself to boredom. Don't move. You know, close your eyes and see if the mind is not racing. And if the mind is settled and you're enjoying the after effects of the opioid and you're chilled and your temperament, you, you know, the boredom is tolerable and you're enjoying that mindfulness and the breathing. And if that happens, then you have, um, you know, succeeded in the first <laughs> home-based trial <laughs> by, <laughs> by, you know, to, to see the first screening step of uh, why is my head racing as soon as my opioids go down. And if you don't move in that time, then that means you have passed the test. But if you move and say, well, screw this, you know, <laughs> this was a stupid challenge that uh, Asher gave. <laughs> and, then, <laughs> and then we have to go back into school reports. <laughs> and how long, yeah, it, it, so that's a brilliant, that's a very practical thing we can all do. How long are we sitting still for? 90 minutes after an exercise 90 session. 90 minutes afterwards. We're sitting still for another 60 minutes. So we're going to sit still for 60 minutes. Yes, sir. And if your head is like chilling still, your, your chronic sport, like lifelong sporty, will still be chilled so they have a longer you know because they've been doing it I told you that the brain actually changes mm -hmm. you know oh, yeah. all parts cerebellum you know amygdala everything has changed so there it has have an advantage <laughs> I think but can you be doing so, emails or you got to sit there and sit no still? you can't you've just you got just to close your eyes and sit with yourself look this is not scientifically driven no. you asked me for a random yeah, critical challenge I think it's a good way of seeing that you know why you not why is your head not celebrating what you've just done mm. despite all the chemicals in your system and so on why is your head starting to <laughs> why is the worry what to do next you know what have I got to do what is this boredom got to move I am just I, I think I'm just messing with you guys I'm just giving you a self screen to see does yeah. that by doing that do look in your life and see have I had periods like those where I can't sustain you know um, the uh, nothingness of life you know and when I do exercise it changes everything it Give, takes away my nothingness gives right? purpose but when I come back from exercise and so on do I go back to nothingness and I can't stand it? So that shouldn't be there. Exercise should be a complement. It should be an add-on. It shouldn't be the only outlet. And that's a sign that there's something else happening in the when you're not in the sports exercise mode. There's a there's a baseline issue that we have to look at. Wow. Asher, Dr. Asher Khan, thank you for sharing you're so welcome. generously. If people want to reach out, engage with you uh, personally, direct uh, or direct uh, a query towards you, where's the best? Or what's the best means to do that by? Oh, I have a you know the best place is my website, uh, which is uh, QANC Queensland ADHD and Neurosciences Clinic, uh, QANC.com.au, um, and I'm on Google. If you place my name there, you'll find me, <laughs> Dr. Asher Khan. And we'll link up some of the resources you shared, like those YouTube, YouTube talks uh, in the show notes, and all of Dr. Asher Khan's uh, details, including the Queensland at QANC.com.au website. So Dr. Asher Khan, thank you for sharing so well and exploring this concept of ADHD, exercise and sport. Thank you, thank you. Pleasure, pleasure being here. Thank you, Brad. Much appreciated. So there you have it, another episode of The Physical Performance Show. And I know and I trust you enjoyed some learnings from today's expert edition. A massive thanks to Dr. Asher Khan for hosting me on site at the Queensland ADHD and Neurosciences Clinic to record this episode. If you'd like to find out more about ADHD in sport and exercise and how to help the ADHD sufferer, you can jump over to qanc.com.au. That's qanc.com.au. Now, I suspect that many of you will want to share this episode with people in your world, be that coaches, athletes, or fellow practitioners. So thanks in advance for sharing this important information. Thank you also to those leaving ratings and reviews over on iTunes. And for the podsies, that's simply a screenshot of the episode you're enjoying at any moment in time, tagging in the show at Physical Performance Show on social media, and we'll reshare those and get a real kick from seeing those go up as well. Another huge shout out to today's show partner, Precision Hydration. Don't forget to jump over and use the code TPPS at checkout to receive 10% off your first order of Precision Hydration's electrolytes or their brand new Precision Fuel range. For those who'd like to support the production of the show, please consider becoming a Physical Performance Show's Learnings member. It's really simple. You can do so over at Patreon. Just search the Physical Performance Show and there you can pledge your support for the show from just $5 per month, which goes a long way in ensuring this show's quality continues as does the output week to week. 
And as a small way of saying thank you for your contribution, we'll grant you complimentary access to all of our back catalogued live stream events and our upcoming live stream events, including September the 4th's live stream event fueling the endurance athlete with uk-based world-renowned sports dietitian rinny mcgregor set to be a fantastic learning opportunity massive thanks to the great folk as always who make this show possible each week daryl misson our audio engineer susan wilkin on all things show administration and matthew olding on all things show graphic design now, if you are stuck with an injury, please reach out b.beer at pogophysio.com.au or jump straight online and schedule your 45-minute online telehealth consultation, pogophysio.com.au forward slash telehealth. Now, coming up on next week's episode of the Physica Performance Show, it has been a bumper second quarter for the 2021 calendar year. At the time of this episode's release, we are knee-deep in the action of the Tokyo 2020-21 Olympic Games. So it's a good time to press pause and recap on some of the many learnings that have come our way in the last 12 weeks. So get set for next week's episode being a physical performance show catch up episode. And following that, I'll bring you a wonderful conversation I had with one of my physio researcher heroes, Professor Stuart Warden from Indiana University on all things preventing bone stress injuries in runners. It is an expert edition you are not going to want to miss. So until next week's episode, keep pursuing your physical best performance. I'm Brad Beer and this has been the Physical Performance Show.